This video is part 8 in a series about Super Nintendo Entertainment System features. First, we'll look at the controller interface the SNES provides and look at what it expects from any input devices plugged into it. Then, four examples of input devices will be examined. The normal joypad, the SNES mouse, the multi-tap, and the Super Scope. We'll conclude with an in-depth explanation of how the Super Scope actually works and how it detects a target on the screen, and how it communicates wirelessly. The Super Nintendo has two ports on the front control deck to insert controllers into. The control deck contains nine signal lines that feed into the seven pins of both of the ports. These seven pins can drive all sorts of input devices, joypads, light guns, keyboards, fight sticks, and even more. First of all, each port has a voltage source of 5 volts and a ground wire used to drive the circuitry within the input device. The ports share a single strobe signal, which is generally used to create a snapshot of the controller's current input and send it to a separate register. The clock lines are then used to read in that register one bit at a time through one of the two data lines. Finally, each port has a separate programmable input-output line that can be used for any additional purpose. Unlike the other lines which are one-directional, this line can be written to or read by either side. We'll look at how these pins are used by the input devices later when we look at each controller in depth. Let's go backwards and look at how the CPU utilizes these nine signals from the control deck. The strobe line can be written to by the CPU by writing to the least significant bit of address 4016. Generally, this line is kept low and the CPU register is kept at zero. This is known as positive logic, where zero corresponds to ground zero volts and one corresponds to source voltage, or plus five volts in this case. To strobe the controllers, a 1 is written to the register and then a 0 written directly afterward. The data lines are readable through the CPU registers 4016 and 4017. The first and second data lines from controller port 1 are read from bits 0 and 1 of address 4016, and the first and second data lines from port 2 are read from bits 0 and 1 of address 4017, respectively. By reading either of these registers, a clock pulse is automatically sent through the respective controller's port clock line. And lastly, each of the programmable I.O. lines are accessible by the CPU as well. These lines can be written to through CPU register 4201 and read in through CPU register 4213. For each of these registers, the most significant bit corresponds to controller port 2, while bit 6 corresponds to controller port 1. The programmable I.O. lines are logically negative, which is the opposite of logically positive. One corresponds to ground, while zero corresponds to a voltage source. This is important to know specifically because this is a bi-directional signal. If one side of the line sets the line high, that is, sets it to zero, the other side cannot set it low. Therefore, the default idle setting of this line should be grounded, a value of one. A value of zero should be written to the CPU register in short pulses, or set to zero to disable it completely. The programmable I.O. line assigned to controller port 2 is special and has another purpose. It is also connected to the PPU external latch. The PPU always holds its end of the line low, since its purpose of accessing this line is just to listen in on what the other two ends, the CPU and control deck, are doing. Every time this line is set high, the PPU will latch the current horizontal and vertical counters that keep track where the scanning beam is currently drawing an image on the screen. These values can then be read by the CPU through registers 213C and 213D respectively. These registers were mentioned back in part 6 about blanking. After these values are latched, the external latch flag will be set. This flag can be used to tell if the counters were latched since the last time they were checked. This flag is located in bit 6 of CPU register 213F. You might be able to guess why the programmable I.O. line is connected to the PPU in this way, but I'll explain more when we get to that part of the video. Now, let's look at the other side of the control deck. We'll assume a standard joypad controller is connected to each port, 
but let's look at just the first port for now. The standard controller has 12 buttons, up, down, left, right, A, B, X, Y, L, R, start, and select. This means that 12 bits are needed to store the state of the controller. Four additional bits are used as an input device signature. The standard controller signature is 0000. The signals that represent the state of the buttons are logically negative, so a pressed button is represented as a binary 1 and a grounded voltage. The standard controller uses five of the seven pins in the controller port. Voltage source and ground, clock and strobe signals, and one data line is used. The programmable I.O. line and the second data line are not connected. When the strobe line is set high, the state of the 12 buttons at that point in time and the four signature bits are copied into the 16-bit shift register. The least significant bit of the shift register is connected to the data line. Every time the clock line is set low, the shift register is shifted right once and the new least significant bit is now connected to the data line. A low 1 bit is shifted into the other end of the register each time this is performed. Once the clock line has been pulsed 16 times, only 1s are left in the register and the data line will stay low until the strobe line is set high again. Here is a code example of how the state of the controller could be stored into work RAM where each bit corresponds to one button. First, send a strobe to the controller by writing 1 and immediately 0 to address 4016. Load the current signal of the data line by reading address 4016 for controller port 1 or address 4017 for controller port 2. You can even store the controller port number, 0 or 1, into X and use index addressing to read both ports with the same code. Remember, reading either of these registers automatically sends a clock pulse through to the controller, updating the shift register and therefore the data line. Now, the least significant bit of the accumulator holds the data signal, and the next bit would hold the second data signal if it were connected. This bit can be shifted into the carry flag by executing a shift write instruction on the accumulator, then the carry flag can be shifted into a memory address with a rotate left instruction. This data reading method can be repeated 16 times to shift each bit into the memory address one by one. Once complete, the final controller data can be read from at once from memory, where 1 means a button was pressed and 0 means the button wasn't pressed. This whole controller reading process would have to be done every frame to get an up-to-date state of the controller input. This is exactly how the SNES's predecessor, the Nintendo Entertainment System, read controller input as well. The exact same hardware registers are used as well, probably for backwards compatibility. In fact, just cutting the two standard joypads cables and swapping the plug-ins, making sure to splice each of the five wires together correctly, would make each controller work on the other system. A, X, L, and R would be impossible to trigger on the SNES without those buttons present on the NES controller, and any software on the NES probably doesn't shift in more than 8 bits on its side, so those buttons would probably, but not definitely, do nothing. However, the SNES has a quick and easy way to read in basic controller input without having to deal with reading or writing data or strobe lines directly. This method is called Auto Joypad Read. Auto Joypad Read can be enabled by setting the least significant bit of CPU register 4200 to 1. When enabled, the controller data will automatically be piped into some separate CPU registers at the start of the vertical blanking period in the background. The CPU can continue to execute other code while this is happening. The least significant bit of address 4212 will be set to 1 while auto joypad read is occurring. This can be used to make sure the process is finished before reading the controller data it produces. When complete, 16 bits of data are shifted in from both controller ports 1 and 2 from both data lines 1 and 2. So 64 bits are read in total. CPU registers 4218 and 4219 hold controller port 1 data 1, which is usually player 1, Addresses 421A and 421B hold controller port 2 data 1, which is usually player 2. Addresses 421C and 421D 
hold controller port 1 data 2, referred to as player 3, and addresses 421E and 421F hold controller port 2 data 2, referred to as player 4. Auto joypad read can be used with any input device, but it will only read in the first 16 bits of each of the data lines for each port. If a controller is designed to send more than 16 bits on one data line, those will still have to be read in the manual way. A combination of auto joypad read and manual reading can be used as well to reduce the amount of manual reading required. Now that we've seen both sides of the data transfer, let's look at four input devices in detail and how they utilize the data and programmable I.O. lines. The standard joypad we just used as an example is very simple. Like mentioned earlier, it has a 16-bit shift register that holds the 12 button states and the 4-bit signature. These buttons are read in the order of B, Y, select, start, up, down, left, right, A, X, L, R, and then 0, 0, 0, 0. Any more bits read past these 16 will return low ones. The order of the buttons is strange, but this is again due to the backwards compatibility of the NES controller. The four new buttons added to the SNES controller are appended to the original eight button bits. The standard joypad leaves the second data line and the programmable I.O. line unconnected. The SNES mouse also leaves the second data line and the programmable I.O. line unconnected. However, it uses a 32-bit shift register to send all of the data that it needs. The first 8 bits are unused and will always be 0. Then, 1 bit for each of the right and left buttons, 2 bits for the current speed setting of the mouse, and 4 bits for the controller's signature, 0001. The next 8 bits are the vertical displacement of the mouse position, and the last 8 bits are the horizontal displacement, both in sign and magnitude format and not two's complement like you may expect. Any additional bits read will return low ones like usual. Due to the number of bits sent, auto joypad read would only receive the button presses and not the translational movement of the mouse. The data for the movement will have to be read in manually through the raw joypad access registers. One interesting thing about the mouse is how the speed setting is changed. It contains a small CPU that converts the raw spinner data into the vertical and horizontal offsets, and the speed setting is stored here to aid with those calculations. You may expect that changing the speed setting would require the use of the programmable I.O. line to send data from the SNES to the mouse, but it finds a way without it. To latch all the input device's data, the strobe line is set high and then low before pulsing the clock line. However, with the SNES mouse, whenever the clock line is pulsed while the strobe line is still high, the speed setting will advance to the next setting out of three possible settings, slow, medium, and fast. So in order to change the speed from fast to medium, for example, the strobe line should be set high by writing 1 to address 4016. The clock line should be pulsed twice by reading address 4016 or 4017 for controller port 2 twice. The data read from this register is meaningless at this point. Then, the strobe line should be set back down low by writing 0 to address 4016. After this, the data line can now be read 32 times to read in the 32 bits from the shift register. The SNES Multitap is an input device that allows four other input devices to connect to one controller port simultaneously. It has a physical switch on it that switches the device between multitap mode and pass-through mode. These modes are often called five-player mode and two-player mode since it was intended to be plugged into the second controller port only, allowing up to five players at once. However, it will work in either controller port and plugging a multi-tap into each port at once can even enable simultaneous 8-player gameplay. When the multi-tap is in pass-through mode, the second, third, and fourth ports are all disconnected, and all seven pins in the first port are connected directly to the seven ports on the multi-tap input. There is no way to even detect the multi-tap is in use when in this mode, since it acts as a pure pass-through, and the one controller acts as if it were plugged into the control deck directly. When in multi-tap mode, 
All four ports are connected, but none of the second data lines or programmable I.O. lines are connected. This means that any input devices that make use of these two lines will not work with a multi-tap when in multi-tap mode. The ground, voltage source, and strobe lines are connected to all four ports at once. The first data line from multi-tap port 1 is connected to the multi-tap's first data line, the first data line from port 2 is connected to its second data line, and both of these ports' clock lines are connected to the multi-tap's clock line. This is the configuration when the programmable I.O. line is low, that is, hex 4.0 or 8.0 for controller port 2 has been written to address 4201. To access the other two ports, the programmable I.O. line should be set high, that is, write 0 to address 4201. When this is done, the first data line from multi-tap port 3 is connected to the multi-tap's first data line, the first data line from port 4 is connected to its second data line, and these ports' clock lines are connected instead. The multi-tap is an example of an input device that reads and reacts to the programmable I.O. line being set high and low by the CPU. The final input device in this video is the SNES's light gun, the Super Scope. It is an example of an input device that controls the programmable I.O. line itself, and the CPU and PPU are in charge of monitoring it and reacting to its changes. Therefore, in order for the Super Scope to function correctly, two things must be done. Number one, the Super Scope receiver must be plugged into controller port two. This way, the PPU's external latch is triggered when the Super Scope sets the I.O. line high. Number two, the CPU should make sure to set the I.O. line low so it doesn't mask out what the Super Scope is doing. This can be done by writing hex 80 to address 4201. As an input device, the Super Scope receiver contains a 16-bit shift register not unlike the standard joypad, and this data is sent over the first data line. The second data line is disconnected. The order of the data is like so. Fire button, cursor button, turbo switch, pause button, two bits that are always 0, 0, null flag, noise flag, four bits that are always 1, 1, 1, 1, and then the four bit signature of 1, 1, 1, 1. Additional bits will similarly read low ones like the previous input devices. The four buttons are self-explanatory, but the two extra flags include extra information about the light gun. Generally, the null flag is set if the receiver can sense that the light gun is active, but it is not pointed at the screen. And the noise flag is set if the receiver can sense that the light gun is active, but the data it's receiving is not in a recognizable format. The remainder of this video will go into detail about how the Super Scope works, including how it recognizes where it is pointing on the TV screen, and how the data is transferred wirelessly to the receiver. First, let's take a closer look at what is contained within the Super Scope and its receiver box. The light gun itself contains a light detector and a lens, which allows the Super Scope to look at just a small portion of the CRT screen at one time. It feeds into a small processor that takes the detector's output and produces command signals that correspond to what buttons are currently pressed and whether light was detected or not. These feed into a few infrared LEDs on the front of the light gun. It also runs off of six AA batteries, which allows it to be wireless. The receiver box contains an infrared light detector that receives the command signals produced by the light gun. These signals are fed into another small processor that converts these signals into the button, null, and noise flags. It also connects to the programmable I.O. line in order to trigger the PPU's external latch. The 16-bit shift register is contained here as well. The whole Super Scope process starts when one of the three buttons on the light gun, fire, cursor, or pause, are actuated. After a button is pressed, the light gun immediately gets things rolling by sending a digital code through its infrared LEDs to be picked up by the receiver. One of six different codes are sent depending on which buttons are held and or pressed. Because of the format they are in, the fire and cursor buttons take precedence over the pause button. Each of these blocks are made up of eight shorter pulses. In order for the command to be valid, 
at least five of these eight pulses must be detected. If the format of these small blocks is malformed, then the noise flag is set. The duration of these commands is about five and a half milliseconds, or about one third of one frame. After the command is sent, the detector is enabled on the light gun, and if the command was determined to be valid by the receiver, it will prepare to capture raster data. For the next 85 milliseconds, just over five frames, the input from the light gun's light detector will be directly sent through its infrared LEDs to be read by the receiver box, given some amplification and fine tuning. Each time the scanning beam from the television enters the field of view of the light gun, a signal is produced. After six signals are detected by the receiver, the programmable I.O. line is set low and then high to trigger the PPU's external latch. The latched horizontal and vertical counters will approximate where the superscope was pointing on the screen at the time the buttons are being held. There is some induced delay due to signal processing, which is why games that utilize the superscope had calibration screens. Calibration had to be done via software. This calibration also helps with the difference between the line of sight of the light gun's detector and the player's line of sight through the scope, especially since this changes with distance from the television set. If a signal was not detected during the entire 85 millisecond window, the null flag is set to denote that the light gun was not pointed at the screen. 10 milliseconds after the raster detection sequence is complete, the process is reset. If the cursor button is held, and or if the fire button is held while the turbo switch is on, the process restarts immediately, otherwise it waits until another button is actuated. Because the receiver detects raster data from the light gun for five frames at a time, the resolution of button presses is every five frames. The target position of the light gun is updated every frame, but the digital infrared button signals are only sent this often. Because of this, the fastest a button can be repeatedly pressed is about 6 Hz, as opposed to the standard 30 Hz of auto joypad read. This is probably one of the reasons why the turbo option exists, in addition to repeatedly pressing fire while holding the super scope being quite tiring. The last couple things to point out about the super scope is its ability to detect color. The three color components, red, green, and blue, illuminate the phosphor coating inside the CRT for different amounts of time. While blue and green illuminate for about 250 and 300 microseconds respectively, red stays illuminated for a whole 1200 microseconds. Because of this, detected red color seems much more smeared out over space than blue or green. Therefore, the superscope actually has an infrared filter in between its lens and its detector, which also blocks out red light. This helps reduce the interference a fuzzy red signal would cause. The other issue the superscope faces has to do with overall luminosity of the image on the screen. Since the superscope is a light gun, after all, if there is no light, it can't function properly. Therefore, it will not work very well if the screen is fairly dark. Green is inherently more luminous than blue, so an image must contain at least 40% green and or at least 60% blue to be detectable by the superscope. Thank you for watching. Next time, we will take a good look at the Super NES's address space and look at its various memory mapping modes.